Good morning. It's great to see you all here. Thank you for coming to the first part of the Stark Lectureship. The next part, of course, as you know, will be at 7 o'clock this evening. But I'm glad to see you here and, uh, and welcome you to the Stark Lectureship. Uh, there also, as I think most of you know, is going to be an open come and go coffee if you just want to sit and chat with a uh, uh, Tatewi, I've been mispronouncing her name. It's not Tatewin, it's Tatewi. So, uh, so, but it's great to have you here today, and uh, w and welcome to Tatewi and and Debbie, who is with her and company her. So uh, today, it's a great privilege to introduce our, our distinguished guest, Tatewi Means, Executive Director of the Thunder Valley Development Corporation. Let's talk about the Stark Lectureship for just a moment. It was established in 1959. Now that's interesting. It almost, you know, it's in 1960. But it, it was actually established in 1959 by Franklin Stark, a dedicated alumnus of our institution, who consistently sought to fulfill the noble mission by recognizing people who demonstrate by the authenticity of their own lives the connection between faith and works. So over the past six decades, this platform has showcased a remarkable array of thought leaders leaders and individuals who have profoundly inter impacted this intersection between faith, ethics, and society. Our previous uh, Stark lectures have been uh, theologian Elton Trueblood, humanitarian Naomi Tutu, Senator Mark Hatfield, who is a great friend of, of George McGovern and worked with him on anti-Vietnam War legislation, uh, renowned columnist Cal Thomas, acclaimed writer Donald Miller, a Blue Like Jazz, fa very famous book, and of course, uh, Senator and humanitarian George McGovern, who is the only person that was a Stark lecture two times. So, uh, and they have illuminate the unique facets of the interplay between faith and action in our ever-changing world. So we're very excited to bring Tatewi Means today. As many of you know, her father was the famous uh, Russell Means, who was the director of, world, of the American Indian Movement, uh, one of the leaders, uh, and ran for president uh, in the 1970s and in the Libertarian Party, as I remember. So Tatewi Means is from the Assistant Wapitan uh, uh, Dakota, Oglala, Lakota, and Ihangtawa, I've been working on it. I said it 10 times after each other to get it with Lyle's uh, expert uh, help. Uh, Ihangtawa Nations in South Dakota. In 2015, uh, Tatewe Means was sworn in as a de deputy state attorney, attorney for the Oglala Lakota co County and a German Marshall Fund Marshall Memorial Fellow. She also holds a Bachelor of Science degree from Stanford University in Environmental Engineering with a minor in Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity, a Master of Arts from Oglala Lakota College in Lakota Leadership and Management, and a Doctor of Jurisprudence in the, with a concentration on Human Rights Law from the University of Minnesota Law School. Tatewin joined the Thunder Valley as an Executive Director in July 2018. Uh, Tatewin was also named a Kelloland a nominee to the uh, Kelloland Remarkable Women Award and Yes, please. Thank you. Uh yeah, I'm better washed day. I'm Dr. B. You ha chante washed day on a bed juice up be. Um my name is Tatewin means my Full name is actually Tatue Dopa Najiwi, which means the woman that stands with the four directions. I was named after my paternal grandmother, who is Ihangtawa, and um, she wanted me to carry her name um, for, for my life so that she would always be remembered in that way. And so, as mentioned, my father is uh, the late Russell Means, my mother is Peggy Phelps of the Sisseton Wapitan Dakota Nation. Uh, and I grew up in my father's homelands on Oglala Makoche in what is now called Pine Ridge or the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. Um, I grew up there as the video indicated and um, have really dedicated my life to serving uh, my community uh, and indigenous peoples more broadly. Um, every time that I went away, that I left home, was uh, to further education, to acquire more knowledge, and to somehow bring that back and be of service to um, our communities. And 
and the broader community as well, non-Indigenous people. Um, I went to high school actually in Rapid City and had my first real encounter with racism, total culture shock when I moved from the reservation to Rapid City um, and, and really understanding what that meant to feel hate from somebody for the first time um, and how devastating that was. And so really understanding and internalizing the need to um, be an advocate for my community at all levels and many different community circles. And so it is an honor to be here today. Thank you for the invitation uh, to share our work that we do at Thunder Valley. I get the exciting job of sharing all the hard work that happens at home. And today uh, my heart is a bit heavy because we're having one of um, a very important ceremony. It's a coming of age ceremony for one of the young men in our community who's in our boys society to do his first buffalo kill. Um, it's a part of, like I said, the, uh, a rite of passage in our community and being able to do that and to have all of the protocols and ceremonial um, necessities followed um, is really an attestation to the fight and the struggle that our ancestors went through to ensure that we're able to do things like this today. Uh, and so that's where our, um, our community is, uh, our co-workers are back home taking care of those spiritual things while I'm here being able to share this important work with everybody. Um, so again, thank you for the invitation. Um, let's see. It's not working. The down? Okay. So Thunder Valley started from ceremony. It's a spiritual organization. This is spiritual work that we're able to do. Um, many years before we became a formal organization in 27, or 2007, excuse me, um, a group of young people, maybe in their early to mid-20s, just getting started in their careers, just getting started in their families, came together and it was right before one of our sacred ceremonies, um, the Anipi or the Sweat Lodge ceremony. And they were just talking. They were talking about some of their frustrations, some of the struggles they saw in our communities for generations, and really asking why can't our communities have what others may have. Why don't we have these? Why doesn't our tribal council do these? And kind of complaining, right? E expressing their frustrations. And when I went into ceremony, when I went into that sacred space, it was a really a call to action from the ancestors to why, uh, how long are you going to wait to let, how long are you going to let others decide the future of your children? Are you not warriors? And as Oglala people, we come from a long line of freedom fighters, of patriots, of, uh, staunch advocates for who we are as distinct Lakota peoples. And so having that call to action, that challenge, or really that mirror put in f before them um, was inspiring and all the motivation they needed. So they really began to have conversations, more intentional conversations in the community and with young people about what they could do. Um, it wasn't like the next day they went and signed their papers to become a nonprofit and started building houses. It was definitely an organic process of how we came to be who we are today. But the conversation started. Um, you know, the fire was lit, and they knew that one thing was for sure connecting our young people to who we are as Lakota people was one of the most fundamental things we had to carry forward for the next generations. And so they started from that. Uh, how do we reach more young people in our community and bring them into this circle of what it means to be Lakota? And so, you know, that it was very humble beginnings. Um, I remember hearing stories of they had one old truck and they started just by cutting firewood for elders, bringing young people in. And seeing that evolve to where we are today is truly inspirational and um, gives me a lot of hope uh, to see the strength of what community can do together. Uh, when I came on in 2018, we sat down as a full organization. Right now we have over 50 employees, so we're definitely growing each year. And we're one of the larger private um, employers on the Pine Ridge Reservation. Um, the Ogala Sioux Tribe obviously is the largest employer, but as a private foundation, private organization, we're one of the larger employee, employers. Um, but we sat down and said, where are we going with this work? You know, we've always had the same mission statement, the same goals for how we wanted to reach community, to strengthen our cultural identity, and to provide healing spaces for our youth and families. 
but where is this going? Why are we doing this work? And that is when we came up collectively with this vision of having a liberated Lakota nation through a return to our language, our life ways, and our spirituality. So really that's what we're um, striving for is liberation, it's freedom. And that word gets thrown around a lot these days in racial and social justice circles. So what does that mean? What does that feel like to an average person going about their day on the Pine Ridge Reservation? What does liberation feel like? What does it taste like? What does it smell like? How does it feel to them? And so that's really what we're trying to define at Thunder Valley, and it's really what we're trying to show and model uh, from the communities we built to the programs that we provide. I'm going to figure it out. I can figure this out. Let's see. Okay. Um, in order to understand the full magnitude of what Thunder Valley um, is trying to accomplish and what we are trying to overcome collectively, uh, we have to understand the history of indigenous peoples broadly and specifically for Lakota people here in this homeland. Um, I always like to share this slide because, I mean, my legal background, <laughs> um, to, to stress and emphasize the importance that legal uh, the laws and policies of the United States, how that has impacted almost devastatingly um, indigenous peoples. It was very intentional, many of the tactics and strategies on how to disconnect us from who we are, from our very identity. And it was very tactical um, and strategic on how to uh, disconnect our family units. Because as indigenous people and as Lakota people, or as a part of Ocheti Shakoni, uh, kinships, Kinship relationships are really important to us. How that intergenerational approach to maintaining community and healthy relationships um, really governed our societies. It was about relationships. It wasn't about power and individual control or asset accumulation and wealth in a Western um, mindset. It was really about the strength of our relationships to one another. And so every policy era that you see up here was very intentional at destroying those relationships and connections, starting from the papal bulls of the Catholic Church um, prior to first contact. It, it was with intentionality that they said, go out, enslave, colonize um, the indigenous peoples of these lands so that we can acquire their lands, so we can acquire those resources um, and basically eliminate our identity from existence. Um, to know that they're part of one's history is really sad. It's really traumatizing to, to, to understand that it was with that kind of mindset that another group of people um, thought about subjugating another. Um, solely based on race wasn't existent at that time, but um, different beliefs and different viewpoints and worldviews. And it's sad to see that that mentality and approach continues today. Um, not only to indigenous people, but across the world. Um, and so it's important to look at these. Um, I always encourage everybody in what is now called the United States to learn indigenous people's history. Um, there are lots of books written by indigenous people um, that share what this is because it's the largest genocide in the world. There are estimates between 50 to 150 million indigenous people were killed in acts of genocide on Turtle Island, or what is now North America, alone. Um, and if that is something you're not aware of, I really encourage you to take the time to understand that. Because that is the history and that is the trauma that we are overcoming as community members and as Lakota people every day. Um, as you go through and you see the different time periods, um, you know, some of the most devastating were the removal eras, the reservation eras, and the allotment and assimilation eras because it displaced people from homelands. Um, you see a lot around the eastern tribes of the United States were displaced and relocated, pushed westward as the <clears throat> land grab was, um, you know, the approach from the United States government. <clears throat> the reservation era, forcing us on to prisoner of war camps, which is what they were called. Um, actually, Indian Affairs was housed within the Department of Defense because we were separate nations until the Bureau of Indian Affairs was created. The very notion that there has to be a whole bureau, a whole department dedicated to managing our affairs as indigenous people is so extremely racist and insulting. There's no other group 
of individuals, of human beings in the United States that have to have a whole bureau to manage their affairs. And so when you see things like that, it's so institutionalized, it's so ingrained into the structural, <laughs> into the structure of the government um, that we are less than, that we are dehumanized, even in the very structures of the U.S. government. So that is the history. What is going on? I don't know. Um, there we go. So that is the history that we're trying to overcome. The brown tan area is our original Ocheti Shakoin territory. Ocheti Shakoin means the seven council fires. Uh, one of those council fires is the Titoan, um, which the Ogwalas, the Sisitoa, the Ihangtoa that we all come from. Um, there's Badewakantoa that are now located in Minnesota. You might know them as Shakopee, um, Prairie Island. Um, there's a, all of those, and we, our territory originally extended up into Canada, as far west as Montana, Wyoming, down into Nebraska and Iowa, and then of course what is now the Dakotas. And so this was our traditional homeland. Uh, you had seven different nations that all were a part of one larger nation. Um, and we would come together at certain times of the year, usually in the summer and the fall, to do our planning collectively as one nation. Um, and when we think about where we're trying to go, where we're striving to be generations from now as we're searching for our own liberation and freedom, this is what comes to mind for me. How do we get, consolidate once again as a Ocheti Shakoi nation to ensure that our people have the same uh, chances at a thriving community as our ancestors did? So this is our traditional homelands. And the, and the pink areas you see here are the nine tribes that are now located in what is South Dakota. Here you go again for the tribes. Standing Rock is, um, it straddles North and South Dakota. So each, each state kind of counts them. But these are the nine tribes that are in South Dakota. So at Thunder Valley, as I said, when you think about the history that we are overcoming, that we are trying to free ourselves from. Um, we have a coordinated approach, uh, a whole community approach through eight initiatives. Um, these eight initiatives really take aim at our indigenous determinants of health in our communities. So one of the, ta one of the impacts we hope to achieve in our community is to have improvements to the health outcomes of our community members. Um, you can look up Pine Ridge Reservation or any other reservation in the state of South Dakota and what you're going to see is non-stop um, information around the health disparities. Um, high infant mortality, high rates of obesity and heart disease and diabetes and all of these other things that are um, really hard as a society to overcome. So the work that we're doing one aspect is how do we change that trajectory of our people so that we have longer, healthier lives, so that our average life expectancy is not 46 years for males and 56 for females. For a first world country like the United States claims to be, that is absolutely appalling that that statistic continues into this 21st century. 46 years old. My son, who is 22, is midlife already, according to statistics. We can't accept that. As a, as a broader society, indigenous and non-indigenous, that can be acceptable to us, that our, our young people are dying at such young ages, for various reasons. So this liberation model, this approach, um, really reflects, uh, we have a, the um, Lakota arts, our artistic um, expression is really important to our people. Um, we have a lot of artists on staff, we're really lucky to do that. Um, I am not so inclined. <laughs> uh, like, as mentioned in my bio, I'm an engineer in a law background, so I, I do think very type A linearly. linearly. Um, but luckily, we have artists that can express, express our work very um, beautifully. And so one of our staff members, her, ma her name is Mary LeBeau, created this visual to really um, share how we approach liberation. At the roots of this tree, and this cottonwood tree is used in... Um, some of our ceremonies, our Sundance ceremony in particularly, and it represents life. Um, and so the roots of the tree, that's our people. And we come from the Pateo Yate, or the Buffalo Nation, and so it's really about reconnecting to the roots of who we are as Lakota people, and that's what gives us life to do this work. The tree trunk is one, um, one of our departments within Thunder Valley called Lifeways and Wellness Equity. 
It's something we launched in 2020 uh, because we understood that there has to be a common thread, a common core that ties all of the work that you see on these branches together. And that's our lifeways. We want to ensure that our community members know who we are as Lakota people, have easy access to learning those teachings, to accessing our ceremonies, to accessing our way of life. Um, and that's where the equity comes in. There's a lot of conversation about what equity means in a broader societal sense. Well, we too are advocating for equity across our communities. There are people that grow up on the reservation their entire lives and do not know how to pray, that don't know where to go to access ceremonies or sweat lodges or who to reach out to to learn these things. And so there's definitely a, an issue with equity and accessibility to our lifeways. Um, and again, it goes back to the roots of those policy er eras. It was very intentional um, to disconnect people from that, right, to, to having access. It wasn't until 1978 with the American Indian Religious Freedom Act that our way of life, that our ceremonies, our language, our songs was legalized. Up, up until 1978, it was illegal to be Lakota. It was illegal to speak our language and to practice our ceremony. You would be arrested. You would be killed in some instances. And so it took an act of Congress to say, okay, Indians, it's okay to be who you are. And we all know how effective laws can be when the people aren't behind it. And so you can imagine how well that went over here in South Dakota, right? Um, and this was after Wudini 1973 and all of the civil rights movements that were happening across the country. And so when we think about accessibility, those are the, the hurdles that we have to overcome in our community. The branches that you see represent our eight initiatives from youth leadership, regenerative community development, social enterprise, uh, housing and home ownership, Lakota language and education, food sovereignty and regional equity, workforce development. Um, the leaves of the trees represent our values as Lakota people. And as the seeds from this tree fall and new trees are planted and begin to grow, that's the ripple effect that we hope to have in the community. That we're building this strong foundation and this work and that it's going to reach more and more and more of our community members um, generation after generation. So in 2012 and 13, we had um, a sustainable communities grant from the Housing and Urban Development uh, Department of the federal government. And we engaged hundreds of hours of community, um, community conversations around what our youth and families wanted to see. Uh, what did they hope for to see in their communities? And for so many generations, our communities have never been asked what they want. It's always dictated to us. It's always imposed upon us. A lot of times in tribal communities, you don't see planned developments. You don't see those kinds of things because it's just housing units that come up around anchor institutions like the Bureau of Indian Affairs, like Indian Health Service, or schools. You don't see communities that are designed by community voice until Thunder Valley. And so after rounds and rounds and several iterations of what the community's vision is, this was uh, the plan that was finalized for our 34 acres of fee simple land right in the heart of the Pine Ridge Reservation. The first drawings actually are really interesting to see because housing, there was, um, it's called the Oyate Omniche or the Ogala Lakota Plan. It was the first ever strategic plan for the Pine Ridge Reservation or the Ogala Sioux Tribe as a government. And there were 12 priority areas that were identified in that plan. One of those priority areas is housing. At that time, almost a, over a decade ago, the Pine Ridge Reservation was deficient 4,000 homes for the population. So when the first drawings and the first iterations happened, it was end-to-end -end housing. Just every type of housing you can imagine, every possible corner, every acre, every inch was dedicated to housing. That was taken back to the community. They said, no, that's not what we want. We want a community. We want an actual community where we can live and play and learn and be ourselves as Lakota people and be safe. We don't want just jam-packed cluster housings. We already have those from the government. We want an actual thriving community. And so we listened. Um, we started to develop more um, plans that better reflected the, the vision of our community and the voice of our youth. Um, so Thunder Valley has always been a youth serving organization uh, and that is always reflected in our community engagement and outreach to the, to the people. 
um, I'll just skip the video for now. We do have a video that talks more about um, how our initiatives work together and an overview about the work of Thunder Valley. It's on our website. I encourage all of you to, to take a moment to look at that. Um, but as we go through, it's just pictures I want to share. Um, it's always nice to, to get a feel for um, where we come from, right? To, to take you to our home, to where this work is actually happening on the ground. I'm not sure how, how many of you have ever been to the Pine Ridge Reservation or to Thunder Valley specifically, but we always invite you to come to visit and to make that connection to place. Uh, one of our board members and one of the founders of Thunder Valley actually said, um, it's one thing to give um, money, to donate, to provide the financial support to, to do the work. That's always important, it's always needed. But that's giving from your mind. We want people to also give from their heart to make that connection. And that takes making a connection to the land. As indigenous people, as Lakota people, our connection is to the land because our ancestors are there. They've been there for generations and generations, for thousands of years. So we always have that tie to the homelands, to the land base. And so for you to really feel and understand the magnitude and the scope of the work that we do, it's important that you make a connection to the place, to the spirit of the place. Um, and so these are just some visuals of um, our community as it's in development. We have 21 single family homes that are for purchase. Um, you know, as we do this, we're, we're humble enough to admit when we've um, could have made different decisions and I think embarking on home ownership opportunities right away um, was a bit cart before the horse um, for and it was a good reminder to always meet our people and our community members where they're at um, while the intention was low-income housing um, we have really high sustainability goals as an organization and as a community. We strive to be energy sovereign one day, so everything that we consume and take from the earth, we're putting back in that same way. Um, not net zero, taking it a step further to be energy sovereign. And um, so these homes are uh, designed with all of that in mind. Every um, home and building actually has um, solar panels so that those that's one of our efforts there's a lot of um, passive solar that's designed into each of the homes and if you notice they're in circles of seven to reflect our traditional encampment as a Ocheti Shakoi with all the openings and doors facing east so that it greets the rising sun um, so you'll see um, examples of Lakota design throughout the community because we wanted to take um, those aspects of who we are as Lakota people and have it reflected in the physical spaces. Um, so one of the things that we understand about liberation, it's nice to build new things. It's nice to build pretty things that the community is proud of and that it feels good to, to live in and to see as you drive by. But it will all be for nothing if we at the heart of it are not changing the mindsets of our community. Um, you'll see communities and other indigenous communities that may have been really lucky to have successful businesses, whether that's casino enterprises or um, other, you know, other enterprises that have helped made them really successful financially, but still running into and, and facing the same societal issues of addiction, of suicide rates, of um, high mortality rates. And so at the heart of our work, we understand that healing has to take place. Thunder Valley is creating a transformational healing movement. How do we create very intentional pathways for our community to heal and not just talk about it in the, the ideal sense? Um, how do you create a collective healing movement for an entire nation? Um, it's not something that we're starting. It's something that we're picking up, a legacy we're picking up, because it's been a part of our healing since the point of colonization. Um, how do we heal from historical traumas and existing traumas and end all of those cycles so that the next generations are free from that? trauma. Um, so a part of that healing is self-healing, obviously. Um, how do each of us explore our own healing journeys? How do we heal our families from those cycles and, and, and those harmful patterns? How do we heal communities? And how do we heal our nation, right? That's that same ripple effect that I talked about earlier. 
Um, but in addition to healing relationships, we have to heal our physical spaces too. Um, for so many generations, uh, indigenous people have been expected to just accept whatever, to accept whatever's given. Um, and many times that's substandard, substandard housing. Um, you see many of our families living in FEMA trailers that are only designed for temporary housing after natural disasters, and they become generational homes for, for families. Um, during COVID, we, we did a lot of data collection in the communities and really saw the need, the continued need for housing because you have 15 to 17 people living in one home. That may be a two bedroom home. Um, and so how do we heal these physical spaces and raise the standard of expectation so that our community knows that they deserve better and they see better uh, in the spaces? This is just one of our um, former staff members working on a solar installation on one of the homes. Um, another part of our physical space is our community center and bunkhouse. So we always invite visitors to come to our uh, community. It's open for rent to community members. We've had birthdays, a wedding, uh, um, community meetings, tribal council has visited us to, to host meetings here. We've had dinners and receptions. Um, a lot of our staff doings happen in the community center as well. And then we get a lot of visitors during the summer season to our bunk houses. Um, <clears throat> we also have really good partnerships with the local hospitals and dialysis units. A lot of their traveling nurses will rent our bunk rooms. So it's just another option for people that are coming through our communities. We also have a 12 unit apartment building, which is that blue building there on the right. Um, all of our streets are uh, identified in Lakota um, as our effort to normalize the use of our language and those are a part of our larger language revitalization efforts. Again, just another view of our regenerative community. Another aspect of our community is we have a two and a half acre demonstration farm. We raise around 500 chickens um, that we uh, provide eggs to the community members and then at the end of their growing or their hatching season I, they would be so embarrassed of me because I'm not using the right terms but uh, when they're done laying eggs a lot then we give them the chickens away to community members and so um, <clears throat> that's also a part of our community outreach is building uh, a local food system that's what food sovereignty means to us another component of our community center is uh, a playground that we've designed. And why I like to share this slide, here's a picture of where it's at right now. It's in the middle of finishing construction. So this isn't um, completed yet. But when we were talking about building a playground outside of our community center, we did outreach to our, our children, our youth, um, and different parents that are in the community and asked what they wanted to see in a playground. Um, what you see around in schools, across our reservation, just standard playground plastic equipment, you know, various swing slides, the standard things. But nothing that really reflects who we are as Lakota people. And so when we did the outreach, we gave all of that feedback to an outside design firm, non-Indigenous, and has actually worked with us for many, many years in Rapid City. Um, and the first iterations they shared back were embarrassing. It had a star quilt pattern and a medicine wheel. Two of the probably most stereotypical Indian images. You Google Indian art, Indian Lakota imagery, you'll get a medicine wheel and a star quilt pattern. Um, they didn't put very much effort into it. They did not look at any of the feedback from the community at all. And we said, that's not acceptable. Try again. Here, here's a list of books you can read to educate yourself so that you are more culturally competent and can, can provide better service to our communities. So they took their reading list and we didn't even provide them the books. We said they have them at the library in Rapid City. So they went to the library and they checked out the books and they did all of the research and they came back with something a bit better. So we had several rounds of that until we arrived at this. So this playground is really based on two teachings um, two Lakota teachings. One is the story of the great race around the Black Hills. Um, <clears throat> and that's what the red track is around um, the outside of the playground. And then each of the play structures represents a sacred site. So there are seven sacred sites in the Black Hills. And each of them is a reflection of that. 
There's also going to be an audio component to our playground that has the teachings of those sacred sites, the time in the spiritual calendar when we are to visit those sacred sites, and it was, it's in Lakota and English. And so all of this is in the, um, the final phases of development and then construction, um, but this is what we finally arrived at. And it took many, many, many months. And so um, having funders and supporters that understand that design and construction in Indian country takes a lot longer than something that may happen off reservation because we want it to be intentional, because we want it to reflect who we are as Lakota people, and we want it to be a space that our children feel connected to. As I mentioned, access to our lifeways is an issue. There are members of our community that have a hard time traveling to the Black Hills, even though it's our sacred space. They have a hard time traveling there, seeing the sites, learning about them, being able to harvest medicines at the right time. This at least gives families an opportunity to start learning those teachings and making those connections through a space that's interactive and fun. Um, so these are the kinds of things that we do every day through all of our initiatives um, in trying to um, bring our identity and who we are into real, um, real spaces that they can feel and experience. Um, I'm just going to go through some of these pictures. We, as a part of our language, Lakota Language and Education Initiative, we have two um, total immersion Montessori sites, and we have a total immersion classroom through the third grade um, that's in partnership with Pine Ridge Schools. Um, <clears throat> so we have trained Montessori guides that actually um, create the environments and work with our children every day. Because there's so much alignment with Lakota ideology and philosophy with Montessori, we actually think that she got some of that from indigenous <laughs> worldview, but we don't have to talk about that. Um, <clears throat> and so we do have these Montessori sites set up, one right on our 34 acres, and the other is in partnership with Pine Ridge School, as I mentioned. Um, here's just one of our Montessori guides working with the children in the space. Um, Here's some of our youth visiting our eggs. Um, we actually have affectionately named um, the place where our chicken live as the chicken palace. And so they too have a very intentionally designed space for, for them to thrive. Um, this is some work of our housing and home ownership team in doing financial literacy with young people and adults as well. Um, our regional equity initiative, I'm actually with Senator Red Don Foster in this photo and she is a former senator from North Dakota, Ruth Buffalo. Um, we were just speaking on the importance of water. We were having a conversation earlier about water, but um, there's a water summit that's been happening in Rapid City for the past several years around water, the importance of that. Um, just a lot of our youth doing summer activities. The summertime is really busy for us um, for engaging the youth. Our workforce development program is um, targeting 18 to 26 year old youth um, in the construction trade, but it's really holistic people development because they also do a lot of social emotional development and educational plans. Um, social enterprise is helping local community members develop business plans and actually executing those plans and developing different types of businesses across our reservation. Um, this is just a, an example of our Lifeways and Wellness Equity team within the org doing a visit um, with some of our staff members to um, a historically significant location for, for our people. I always like to end when I give um, com give presentations to a mostly non-indigenous audience. We're always asked on how, how can we be of more support to indigenous communities? How can we offer support? How can we help? What can I do to make a bigger impact? How do I be a good ally? Um, and so I always like to share these because um, I think it's important and it's, it, those are good questions to ask. Um, as I mentioned before, knowing indigenous history of Turtle Island and the specific indigenous history of the land you occupy. Um, there are so many resources out there. Um, what technology is today, there's really no excuse of not knowing this history. And it's not even just about the people. Not, we're not centering ourselves in that. It's knowing the history of the land. Um, and that's important for everything because it's recognizing that the land has a spirit, has an energy, and that deserves to be told too. Um, we were part of a conversation once and they were talking about creative placemaking um, and this Oneida elder got up and said it's not about placemaking, it's about place knowing. 
Um, so here it's, it's decentering ourselves as human beings as the most important and saying we're recognizing the importance of the land first. And so knowing that history um, is the most respectful thing to do. Treaties and land back, um, they're not just slogans. They're not just slogans and, and these artifacts of the past, these remnants of the past. Um, they're legal documents, obviously legally enforceable around treaties. There are many that govern this area, this land right here that we're on, that are a part of the Ocheti Shakoe Nation. Um, and it's a cause, it's one of the greatest causes of contention between indigenous people and white people um, because it's about land and boundaries. Um, and so understanding what those treaties are and what they mean um, is really important. And that will give you a deeper understanding of what this land back movement is, right? You hear some of the larger, more national indigenous organizations talking about it. My, my father and my aunties and uncles were talking about it in the 70s. Their ancestors before them were talking about it in the 1800s. That's why we have treaties, because we know the importance <clears throat> of the connection to land. And so <clears throat> we have a lot of um, nonprofit organizations, churches, reaching out to say, how do we um, have a reckoning with the past? How do we reconcile all of these harms that were done in a meaningful way that's not superficial and not just about money? Um, and so there are some nonprofits that are actually um, signing titles over to indigenous people, to the land, the deeds, signing the deeds over to the indigenous community, to the tribes, to other indigenous nonprofits, and then paying them a lease. Um, those are very real examples of how to, to be a part of land back. It's not always just about the treaties. Those are very tangible things you can do um, to be a part of supporting and recognizing indigenous history. Indigenous data sovereignty, I kind of alluded to it when I was making the, the joke about Montessori, but uh, our communities are probably the most studied and the most appropriated. Um, so many research studies are done on indigenous communities, whether those relate to health, um, education, whatever it may be, um, and it's always very extractive. The information is extracted and then we never see any outcome from that or any positive um, results happen from that. And so um, there's a big movement. It started in New Zealand with the Maoris <clears throat> around data sovereignty. Um, how do we protect our teachings, our languages, um, so that our future generations have access, but that they're not appropriated and stolen? Um, so many of our language, because of those efforts of boarding schools and such to um, eliminate the use of our language, um, it was outsiders or white people that recorded the language, that made books out of them, and then sold it back to our people to make a profit from it. And so this data sovereignty movement is how do we get all of that information back in the hands of the indigenous communities so that we can use them for our, our own children and communities. Um, changing the narrative. This is a really important part of our work at Thunder Valley because our communities um, have been, the stories of our communities have been dominated and controlled by non-indigenous peoples for far too long. You see who is in um, media, um, who's in Hollywood that are telling stories about indigenous people, how we're portrayed, and it's always non-indigenous people. You're kind of seeing a shift in that, right? There are shows like Reservation Dogs, um, Lily Gladstone just won a, what, um, what is it called? An, a Golden Globe, that's right, um, for the story that they told around the Osage. Uh, so you're starting to see a shift in that. Um, some some people in Hollywood, some non-indigenous people in Hollywood are, are picking up some of our stories and trying to tell them in really authentic and respectful ways. There's a ways to go, but it's a start. And I think that's an important conversation starter on how do we, as indigenous communities, tell our own stories and reach millions like these have been able to do. And that does take support from non-indigenous people. Um, so how are you a part of changing, helping us to change the narrative of our com own communities? We're tired of turning on the news and only seeing negative things about our communities, only talking about the crime, only talking about the hardships that we're having because there's so much life and positivity that happens in and amongst our people. Um, Thunder Valley is one example. We're not the only ones fighting for change. We're not the only ones that are advocating for a better life for our community members, but it's not talked about and it's not shared. Um, it is why I appreciate this opportunity so much because this is the future 
of what our communities can look like. We work a lot with other community partners that have that same vision, that have that same hope for our young people that they can expect and demand a better life and a better future. And so that takes the work of the whole collective on telling our stories in a different way. Um, and then finally, support indigenous-led organizations and develop those relationships. There are a lot of non-indigenous um, organizations that come into our community. Um, I, I like to call it helicopter support. They drop in, they might drop some support, and then they go away again. But there are people, community members, really grassroots effort, like you see at Thunder Valley, that are happening every day that um, need the support. Less than a half of percent that less than a half of 1% of all of philanthropic dollars go to indigenous-led organizations. Less than a half of percent. And in South Dakota, the rates are even worse. We don't get any support from Thun as, at Thunder Valley from donors or organizations in South Dakota. All of our support comes more regionally and nationally. Um, and that has to change. Um, we don't want to just be talked about negatively in the media. We want our broader community to be a part in supporting the, the real change that's happening in our communities. Um, so with that, I thank you for the time to share our work at Thunder Valley. I hope it gave you a deeper insight into to what's happening in indigenous communities, um, led by grassroots peoples and organizations, and that our future is so bright and hopeful because of the, the work that our young people have done to make this become a reality. So, Wopila. We have time for a question or two, if anybody would like to ask a question. For Tatewi. Alicia. I'm curious about the comment earlier about the BIA. Is it possible to deconstruct the BIA? What would it take to do that? Yes. It is. Oh, I was interviewed once on MSNBC about how I felt about Secretary Holland being sworn in, you know, first indigenous person, there was all this hype around it. And I think I surprised them with my answer because I said, I'm excited because I think the time to talk about how we dismantle the BIA can now happen. And they were like, wait, what? Um, and I think it's going to take indigenous people in those spaces um, to do it. Uh, there, there's, in this fight for our liberation, our freedom, there's a role for everybody. Some it's in grassroots work, community level work. Some it's in advocacy. Some it's in direct action. Uh, some it's within the systems itself, the systems and institutions. And that's hard work to do. Um, I was a former attorney general of the Oglala Sioux tribe for five years before I came to Thunder Valley. So I know and understand how hard it is to change those archaic systems from within. Um, but I think it's going to take you know, all the efforts at every level to do so. Um, do I see it happening in my lifetime? No. But it can be a part of our vision for generations in the future. So we can start planting those seeds today. And um, I used to say the goal in changing systems from within is to one day um, not have a job there. Right? And our, some of our staff members have said that. We want to do this work so effectively that one day there isn't a need for a Thunder Rally. It's just a community where people are living and thriving. And so um, I hope that those are some conversations that are happening at the I doubt it, but um, I, can, I can put it on my vision board and try to manifest it for generations from now. Um, I think it's going to take a complete change in worldview on how we. Um, view land, because it always comes back to land. Um, I think there's a fear if that was done away with, what happens to all that land? Would we have to give it back to the Indians? And what does that mean? Um, I mean, you see examples of land reversions happening all over the country. And I think there's this fear of, OK, if indigenous people got their land back, they're going to kick out all the white people. And where would they go? But that's not our worldview. That's not how we approach things. And we don't ever see ourselves as the owners of the land to control and to manipulate and to, to leverage, to, to gain power, right? It was always about caring for the land. And so I think there's going to be a moment of truth coming when the climate crisis is right in our face. I mean, it is now, but when it's right there, um, 
how can indigenous people help to restore that balance with the earth? That's why land back is so important because we have those teachings. We've lived here for thousands of years. Um, and so I think, it's, I think the climate is gonna force the hand of the government to do some of that reckoning. Thank you for coming today. Mm -hmm. We were very much appreciative of that. Mm -hmm. and, and really, the reason why I, I and we wanted to bring to Tain, we it's, it's such a positive story, such an exciting thing to see what you were doing there and, and redeveloping their, your own sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And so we congratulate you on what has already happened, and we're wanting to maybe we should uh, organize a trip and come out and pay a visit sometime. That would That'd be, be great. Really great. Yes. So. Yeah. Thank you for coming, everyone. I really appreciate you. And let's let's have one more round of applause.